The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Well, I invite you to turn to Hebrews and to chapter 10, and I'm going to read uh, the first 18 verses as you follow along. In many ways, uh, in turning to the Bible tonight and to this particular theme, uh, we're actually uh, providing, if you like, the foundation for all the songs we've just been singing. If someone said, well, why are the lyrics to those songs so centered on Jesus? Why do they speak about what he has achieved? Why do we anticipate these things? And of course, the answer to that is in the Bible, and perhaps in a quite particular way, Uh, here in Hebrews chapter 10. So let me read. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshippers having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sin every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, these are offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He abolishes the first in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, He sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us, for after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Amen. In the 1970s in Fort Lauderdale, Texas, a Presbyterian minister by the name of James D. Kennedy was... Uh, stirring up his congregation to reach out to friends and neighbors uh, with what actually became uh, an event or actually more than an event, a series of opportunities under the heading Evangelism Explosion. And that, of course, reached us over here, and some of you may actually have participated in it. If you did, you would know that engaging with people in conversation, the agenda was, however the conversation began, to reach the point where one, in speaking to somebody, had the opportunity to ask two questions. Question one, to say to the person, have you come to the place in your life where you know that if you died, you would go to heaven? And then the follow-up question, if you were to stand before God, and he were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven, what would you say? Now, those are obviously very pointed questions, and they're very important questions, 
and they are, of course, humanly contrived questions, but they demand an answer. And of course, if you pose them to yourself tonight, you will come up with your own answer. For surely, it is a question that we certainly ought not to leave aside or to postpone, really, for another week or another day, because it is of vital importance. And I want to say to you, especially those of you who perhaps think you are about to get an A because of your answer, I want to issue an immediate warning to you that if you are planning to answer this question in the first person, there's a distinct possibility that you may be about to go wrong. Because I, because I. Some people say, well, because of something that has been done by me. Someone might say, because of that which is happening in me. So, on the one hand, on, a, on the basis of human effort, on the other hand, in the understanding of human experience. But the only answer, and the only answer that could be found in the passage that we've just read in Hebrews chapter 10, is an answer which begins not in the first person, but in the third person. Not because of the fact that I did this, or I have done that, or I believe this, but rather because of what he has done for me. So that my acceptance with before God and my standing before him tonight and on the day when we do stand before him, as we are reminded in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 10, we will not be saying it is because of anything that I have done, but it is entirely because of something which you, Lord Jesus, have done. And of course, we're thinking expressly about the role that Christ plays as the great high priest. We began last evening uh, to recognize that in the work of Jesus, in the atonement, in his work of, as mediator, he has fulfilled the office, the threefold office of prophet and priest and king, distinguishable facets of an indissoluble reality. And last night, we at least tried to understand that in the work of the prophet, he is coming to speak to our ignorance and to our blindness. And we tried to say to one another that when the Bible is proclaimed in the power of the Holy Spirit, God speaks to our hearts, drawing us to an understanding of things that we would otherwise not know and bringing us by grace to himself. That's why, of course, uh, Paul writes, well, how could anybody ever believe in whom they have not heard? How could you ever believe in someone whom you have not heard? How will they hear? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And that was the role that we pondered last night. Now we come to uh, the role of Christ as priest. And as we said last night, each of these functions addresses, confronts us with something. The need for a prophet confronts us in our ignorance, and the need for a priest uh, confronts us with the fact that we are by nature sinfully and hopelessly estranged from God. And the story of the Bible, the big story of the Bible, is the wonder of the fact that although God recognizes our rebellion against him, our indifference in him, although those facts are as stated, still the story of the Bible is of God coming to pursue us in order that we might know him, in order that we might understand him, and in order that we might glorify him and enjoy him forever. He has come actually to redeem and to restore rebels. And throughout the story of the Bible, all the Bible stories that some of us have known since childhood, all these great mighty acts of God, of him coming down and doing things and bringing his people out of bondage and so on, as we read that cumulative story, as we build the jigsaw as it goes all the way through, what we discover is it all finds its fulfillment in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why when we read our Bibles, we must always keep our eyes for Jesus. When we take our eyes off Jesus, we lose our way around the Bible. 
And if you were brought up in the same kind of Sunday school that I was, then you learned about the fact that in the Old Testament, uh, Jesus is predicted. Uh, in the Gospels, he is revealed. In the Acts, he is uh, preached. In the epistles, he is explained. And the book of Revelation, he is anticipated or expected. And so uh, when we come to this matter of priesthood, we recognize that the first readers of the Hebrews uh, letter were, of course, Hebrews. They were Jews. And so he is writing expressly to these people who have a background and an understanding in the way things were. They understood that what he was doing here uh, took them all the way back to the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. And they understood what was going on there. That on that occasion, you will remember, the priest took two goats, one of which was then killed, and the other was driven out into the wilderness, killed as a sacrifice. And once the other uh, beast had sins confessed over it, then it was driven away. When that sacrifice had taken place on the Day of Atonement, the people then would gather outside waiting for the high priest to reemerge. And the reemergence of the high priest would testify to the fact that God had accepted that sacrifice. And so as this letter is written to them, and as they begin to understand it, then they are recognizing that all of that program process has now changed because of who Jesus is and because of what he has done. By his death on the cross, he has become both the sacrifice and at the same time, the scapegoat. And if your Bible is actually open at, at chapter 9, as mine is too, then you can see there that he contrasts, the writer contrasts all the previous uh, attempts that couldn't perfect the conscience of the worshiper. They deal only with food and drink and various washings and regulations for the body imposed until the time of Reformation. Then here we go. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Why and what are you going to say when you stand before Jesus? What are you going to say when you stand before God? And he says, why would I let you into my heaven? I hope you're not going to say because I, I was a deacon. I hope you're not going to say because I was a pastor. I hope you're not going to say because I was a Bible teacher. I hope you're not going to say I was because I was baptized. I hope you know to say because on that day, the Lord Jesus Christ secured for those who believe an eternal redemption. In other words, he radically altered everything for all time. And in the same way that the people would stand outside waiting for the reemergence of the high priest. So on that day when it became darkness at midday, on that day when a loud cry sounded out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And on that day when the curtain was torn in two, everything was radically changed. What a tragedy it is when people come to us and say, well, I know you're a religious person. Well, of course, we are religious people. We're in engaged in these things, but we're not going to accept that. We're going to say, oh, you don't really know how radical I am. I want to tell you about this day when at noon it turned dark, like it used to do when I was at school in, in, uh, in uh, Glasgow. And I was thinking about it the other day because we had a beautiful day and all of a sudden it went to total darkness. And I told the people around me, I said, when this used to happen when we were at school and they turned the lights on, some bright spark near the back would say, it's the end of the world. <laughs> and then it would go right through the whole group. It's the end of the world. <laughs> well, it is going to be the end of the world. Prepare to meet your God. Now, let's just say two things about this accomplishment that is there in the work of Jesus. First of all, there is no need for any repetition of the sacrifice. 
No need for any repetition because the text makes it clear. It was once for all. No need, like the high priests that had gone before, to offer sacrifices daily, first for their own sins and then for those of the people. And the reason there was no need, this is Hebrews 7, since he did this once for all when he offered up himself. We read it there in verses 11 and 12 in our text. Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. In other words, finished. It is finished. It is accomplished. There is no need for repetition, nor is there any need for any addition. Or perhaps we say it better. There is no possibility of anything added to the finished work of Christ. Now, those of you who have come from a Roman bi Catholic background, that really makes you sit up in your seat, or it should. Because in the context of Roman Catholicism, you have been taught that you add to that. You finish up what is not quite finished. And if you don't get it finished up, you'll finish it up in purgatory. Why is that? Because of a total misunderstanding or a flat-out rejection of what the Bible actually says. There is no need for any addition to the flawless, finished work of Jesus. All these fellows were standing up daily. They would go to the front of the line. Uh, they, it would look like a bad, a bad cue at... Uh, Heathrow Airport, and they would finally make their way up to the front, and then they would go back, and they would do it all again and again and again. And some people at uh, evangelical meetings, they seem to do that. Anytime anybody has an appeal, they go up to the front, and then they go back, and then another couple of weeks, they come back up to the front again, then they go home, and then they receive Jesus twice, and then they try it a third time and a fourth time, and so on and so many times, because somehow or another, they're unprepared to accept exactly what the Bible says. He says, I promised. I promise. Trust me. I finished this. I have completed it. Now, you say, well, this is like bringing coals to Newcastle. I mean, did you really come all this way just to tell us everything we know? Yes. <laughs> yes. I love to tell the story of unseen things above. I love to tell the story for those who know it best seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory we sing the new, new song, it'll be the old, old story that we have loved so long. I love to tell the story. And you know why? Because we forget so soon. Because some of us have actually entered into a phase of life where the atonement seems like a mathematical formula where it is some kind of theological construct that allows us to make sense of these variables. And we don't see the immensity of the love of the Father, that the Father actually planned for his Son to fulfill this role, that what the Father arranged, the Son agreed to. And that is why he went to the cross because they had determined in eternity that this would be the way in which the door would be opened up for men and women to know forgiveness and to know freedom and to enter into the reality of life as God intended it. How thankful we are for the, for the poets and the hymn writers, the songwriters, who have crystallized for us so many things. So many of them at the end of the 19th century wrote with children in mind. And... I suppose, as a simple soul, the children's songs are as meaningful to me as any. Cecil Francis Alexander, who was from Londonderry and was the wife of uh, 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 an Anglican or a Church of Ireland uh, minister, she wrote with that in mind. She's the one who wrote once in Royal David City to teach children the nature of the Incarnation. She is also the one who wrote, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, to teach children the doctrine of creation. And she is the one who wrote, there is a green hill far away outside a city wall where the dear Lord was crucified who died to save us all. There was no other good enough to pay the price of sin. Really? Really? 
He only could unlock the door of heaven and let us in. Oh, dearly, dearly has he loved. And we may love him too and trust in his redeeming work and try his works to do. <laughs> I don't want to be horribly nostalgic tonight, but I suppose when I come home and see some of your faces, you remind me of people I've known for a hundred years. <laughs> And, and also, I recognize that as a small boy, I sat through evenings like this. I thought they were interminably long, and I thought the fellow would never, ever quit. And I, so I sympathize with anyone under the age of 12 or 15 who who's, finds himself stuck here tonight. But every so often, they would have, uh, in the old days, of course, somebody who would come up and sing, sing a song. And, uh, uh, you know, there were 90 and 9 that safely lay in the shelter of the fold. And it was always like, you know, they played a Hammond organ behind it, and it was like, woo, you know. <laughs> and then, and then it, came, it came, if, if, but none of the ransomed ever knew how deep were the waters crossed, nor how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found the sheep that was lost. And I can still recall, even as a child, thinking, what a wonderful shepherd he must be. My grandfather was a shepherd in Caithness. I have his crook. I'll only meet him in heaven. He died before I was born. Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, knows you, made you, loves you, longs after you, seeks to woo you and win him, win you to himself. Because what we're actually pondering when we look at this, and I'll come to a moment or two of application, but what we're considering is the fact that Jesus went into the presence of God as if he were the only sinner in the world, enduring the wrath of God, so that we then, because of that, and because of his sacrifice, and because he was crucified outside the city wall, driven away, as it were, like the scapegoat. His work is for ours to trust. Now, that is as much background as I want to give to the notion of his priesthood. And as I did last night, I want to, but perhaps with greater clarity and brevity, uh, just make three points by way of application. And the first is simply this, to say that the message of the cross or his high priestly work deals, first of all, or provides, if you like, the answer to my failures, the answer to my failures. Of course, the Bible speaks not so much about failure as it speaks about sin, but it is our failure because by nature we have rejected the position of dependence that is ours by creation. We've been made by God, for God, and sustained by him. But what has happened to us from the Garden of Eden on is that we have established a, a very strong position of independence. We failed to love God, certainly with all our heart and mind and soul and strength. And whether we've been actively rebellious against him or whether we've just been casually indifferent to him, We've really been proclaiming our self-dependence. And it is something that dies hard, and it is something that is ingrained, at least in the culture in which I serve. The, the number one song still in secular funerals in America is I Did It My Way, which is phenomenal when you think about it. I mean, in many of them, you've got an open casket and a dead body lying there, and some poor soul singing, I did it my way. Now, if I'm there, I'm going, so how has that been working for you? Because <laughs> you're dead. You're dead. To think I did all that, what? And may I say, not in a shy way, oh, oh no. Oh, no, not me. I did it my way. For what is a man? What is he got? If not himself, then he is not. Second one is the wind beneath my wings. What wings? <laughs> I 
Now, I don't want to be unkind to people, especially if you, had, if you were planning on having my way at your funeral. <laughs> You'll have a jolly hard time doing it now after this. <laughs> See, God has written his law into our hearts. He wrote his law in our hearts. He set eternity in our hearts. That's why when people say to you, when you're dead, you're dead, we hear what they're saying, but we know something that they're not prepared to acknowledge. Namely, that they don't actually believe that. That God has set eternity in our hearts. That he's written his law in our hearts in order that we might understand what it means to break his law. Because by breaking his law, we not only offend against him, but we also uh, not only offend against his law and also his love, but we offend against our highest welfare. The Ten Commandments are not there to destroy our lives. The Ten Commandments are there to show us how God makes things really, really work. Imagine, imagine a week with no adultery. Imagine a week with no theft. Imagine a week, well, you know, just go through the whole list. I mean, it would shut the whole nation down, wouldn't it? I mean, think about all the things that you'd have to bring back out of Marks and Spencer's. And we have to say to people, the reason that you are as you are in all your capacity for goodness is because you were made in the image of God. And the reason that you are as you are, as you are in all of your confusion and failings and misgivings is because although you were made by God and for God, you have substituted Jesus for idols that offer a lot but can't satisfy. And when we and I love those books that were recommended tonight. I, I wanted to test that fellow out to see if he is actually as generous as they say, you know. <laughs> so well, we were about to find out, but I love I love the fact that it, these books are written in order that we might engage with people. And and the challenge actually of first believing this so that we may rest in the confidence of it, is being able then to break it down in such a way that we can say to people, here in Jesus is the ultimate adventure. Here in Christ is the understanding of all of the brokenness and, and, and misconfigurations of our lives and our relationships. And to be able to say, because we've missed the target. What's the target? To glorify God. What have we done? We glorified ourselves. How does it get fixed? Because Christ did not regard his own glory as something to be grasped, but he made himself as no reputation and being found in the likeness of man. He became obedient even unto death, the death on the cross. So that we've exchanged the glory of God for the glory of ourselves, and he's exchanged the glory of heaven in order that we may then find in what he has done the answer to our question. Uh, I was driving in the car. I was being driven in the car. I came past uh, uh, the, the Crown Bowl place and was intrigued to find out that, uh, this is in Clarkston, that uh, there's a 50% off if you want to join uh, the bowling club, which I thought, well, no wonder. I mean, who really wants to join the bowling club? <laughs> then I thought, I might like to join a bowling club. I mean, it's more of my pace now. And, uh, but the trouble with that bowling club, because I've seen it, is those blooming things don't go straight. <laughs> they don't, I mean, what's the point? You try to roll it, and the blooming thing goes off like this, or it goes off like that. You know what that is? That is inequity. It is impossible for them to go straight. You either make them curve in the way, or you make them curve out the way. And that's what Luther was saying when he said the problem with us in our lives is that we are curved in upon ourselves. We're focused on ourselves, focused on our own fulfillment. That's why my marriage is in the place it's in. Not because she's this, not because of that, but because I am turned in upon myself. And the Bible says that's our failure. Not only have we missed the mark, not only are we iniquitous, but we're transgressors. Transgressors. I confess I did a little transgressing earlier this evening. I'm not going to tell you what it is. I mean, I wasn't alone. But you know when you come to those double yellow lines? <laughs> you know when you come to the place that says this is for electric cars to park? 
You could always say, but I thought it was electric. I don't know. <laughs> then now you're in real trouble. One, you did it. Two, you're telling lies to cover it up. Why do we do that? Because we're messed up. What do we need? Not a religious talk. We need a savior. We need somebody who has entered into all of this shame, all of this ignominy, all of this mess, and has taken upon himself all of that mess so that we might enjoy all of his righteousness. The trouble with it is, of course, that by nature, we don't want to admit to any of it. And the attempts that are offered to us of dealing with guilt and failure um, are, are poor. Uh, we try and repress these things or rationalize them or run away from them or just say, well, I can just forget about it. I've discovered something, and that is that mere time, the passage of time, does nothing either to the fact or to the guilt of sin. The fact that I may have put 20 years away from what I did 20 years ago, time does not fix that. It doesn't fix the, fix the fact, and it doesn't fix the guilt. Therefore, we know I have those facts, and I'm aware of that guilt. And I say to you again, the glorious news of the priestly work of Christ is to say to men and women, on the strength of what we just read here, and the writer of the Hebrews says the Holy Spirit is teaching us. How is the Holy Spirit teaching us? He's teaching us the Old Testament. As the Holy Spirit says, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. How good is that, you see? You mean we get a redo? You mean we get a fresh start? You mean we get transformed? Absolutely. Now, that's the first thing, that he comes to deal with our failings. And uh, also that he actually comes to deal uh, with our fears, with our fears. David Watson, the late David Watson, um, in one of his books, I think it's the book, My God is Real. I haven't looked at it in a very long time. But he tells the story in there of speaking at a university mission. And at the university mission, he gave an evangelistic talk, and then he led people in a prayer of repentance and of faith if they would follow along with him. And when that had concluded, he came down. And as he was standing there, a girl came up to him. And he says in the book, she was tough. She looked tough, she was tough, and she still had a cigarette in her hand. And she came up to him, and she said, Mr. Watson, I prayed your prayer. And then she walked away. The following evening, when he finished, a girl came up to him. He didn't recognize the fact that it was the same girl. She actually looked different from the previous evening. And as he spoke to her, she said, when I came to your talk last night, I felt as guilty as hell. I went home and I cried all night. And I've come back to tell you that I did what you said and I understand forgiveness. I wonder, do you understand forgiveness? I wonder, I speak to someone perhaps tonight, you've never actually ever come to Christ and laid down your failures, acknowledge your sins, because he is the one who deals with that and all the fear that accompanies it. And it is important for us to understand that it's not a matter of God overlooking our guilt, saying somehow or another that it doesn't matter, but it is because he deals with the matter. And in Jesus, and we've sung about it tonight, about the chains, in Jesus, the leverage that Satan uses to fill us with fear has been destroyed, has been destroyed. At the very beginning of Hebrews, you get this in, cha in chapter 2. Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things. Here we go, that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong 
slavery. By embracing death, by taking it into himself, he has destroyed the devil's hold on death, and he frees all who cower through life, scared to death of death. Now, I must tell you, I'm not a great fan of death. I'm not exactly looking forward to the prospect. So I'm not always singing the songs the way they tell you to sing them, which is like, I, I, I do not fear the final night. I sing, and though I fear the final night. I mean, I don't want to die with a tube sticking up my nose and all by myself somewhere in the Southern General Hospital. If that's okay, you see. I'm just being honest with you now. You say, well, I thought you just said he deals with a fear. Well, yeah, the fear of death, but not necessarily the fear of the process of how you're going to die. It's the fear of the eventuality of what will happen. And what have we revealed to ourselves in the two years of the COVID? We've revealed the fact that the writer to Hebrews gets it absolutely right, that the great underlying fear of all fears is the fear of death because of the awareness that is instilled within us of eternity that none of us deep down believe for a moment that somehow or another there is not an accountability factor here. How are we going to deal with that? And the answer is that Christ died the death, which was properly ours. He bore the sins, the penalty, annulling it, and he lives, and he lives forever. The final thing is the final thing, that not only does it deal with our failings and deal with our fear, but it does actually deal with our finals, with our finals. I remember school well enough to know that uh, there were certain classes where there was no exam at the end. And um, if there was no exam at the end, then you treated it, you know, well, at least I did, like, whew, this is good, you know. Um, as soon as they said, oh, no, there's an exam at the end, or we better face up. And that's why you see our friends and our neighbors are intrigued by the work of the nihilists and the atheists and the agnostics because it ministers to their own hope and longing and desire. It's Robin Williams in the Dead Poets Society, if you remember. He takes the boys out and he shows them all the people who were the former pupils and he says to them, see those fellows there? One day you will be those fellows there. One day you will be, but listen, seize the day because this is all you've got. He was saying that because he was an existentialist. He's saying that it's written in such a way as to say, it doesn't really matter. It's Chris Christopherson in uh, yesterday is dead and gone and tomorrow's out of sight. Let the devil take tomorrow. For tonight I'll take your hand. I don't care about tomorrow. And the word of the gospel says you better care about tomorrow because it is appointed unto man once to die and after this comes judgment. How often do you hear this from pulpits in this day? No, you hardly hear it at all. Or if you hear it, somebody says it in a way that is entirely unloving. The contrast between the temporary and the repeatable sacrifices of Leviticus is there in the work of Jesus in his atoning death. I could see some of your eyes when I said I'm a little fearful of those things. I said, well, you're not supposed to say that. Well, I say quite a lot of things I'm not supposed to say. My, my wife tells me about it regularly. But I want to finish with two quotes, one a short quote and one a little longer, but it won't be very long. The first is from Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great Victorian preacher. And uh, he is within four weeks of his death, and in conversation, he died, incidentally, on the 31st of January, 1892. And um, four weeks prior to his death, he is engaged in conversation, and he quotes to the fellow that he's talking with um, a verse from the hymn. Um, well, I'll tell you what the verse of the hymn is. No, I know, I know the hymn now, I remember. Before the throne of God above, I have a strong and perfect plea. And the, the, the verse that he quotes is, uh, behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect, spotless righteousness, uh, the great, unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace. And then addressing his friends for the last time, he said, though I have preached Christ crucified for more than 40 years, 
and have led many to the master's feet. I have at this moment no ray of hope, but that which comes from what my Lord Jesus Christ has done for guilty men. Do you get that? I have preached the gospel for 40 years, and as I face my death, I have no ray of hope. He doesn't say, I have no ray of hope, full stop. He says, I have no ray of hope, save that which comes from the work of the Lord Jesus. If you read Christian biography, you will find that that is not unusual. This is the slightly longer quote, and this is from somebody more up to date, although also gone on before us, Martin Lloyd-Jones. He says, there is but one cure for the um, ills of man. When my conscience accuses me, there is but one thing I know of that can give me rest and peace. It is to know Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God, has forgiven me. It is to believe and to know that because he loved me and died for me, I am clear of accusations. And conscious as I am of my weakness and my failure and my lack of power to live a life worthy of the name, I am again driven back to him. It is only from him and the power of the Holy Spirit which he imparts that I can be made more than conqueror. And as I contemplate myself lying on my deathbed and going on to meet my maker and my judge eternal, my only hope is that I shall be clothed with the righteousness of Jesus Christ and that he will take me by the hand and present me faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. It is always and only in Christ that I find satisfaction. It is only in him that his problems are solved. The word with all its methods cannot help me at the moment of my greatest need. Christ never fails. He satisfies always and in every respect. Wesley was right. Thou art Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. So, what do you think the man on the side of Jesus said when he entered into heaven? And the angel, whoever it was at the gateway, said, well, what are you doing here? He said, frankly, I've not got much of a clue. Well, so he said, well, what have you been, a, a religious person? No, horribly irreligious. Were you ever baptized? No, never. Have you ever been involved in evangelism? <laughs> no. Well, I'm going to have to get a supervisor. <laughs> the supervisor comes and presses him, and he eventually says what all of us can only ever say. If you were to die and God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? You're going to say, because the man on the middle cross said that I can come. Not something that I do or have done. Not something that I feel or experience, because our feelings go up and down. Not something that is inside of me, but something that is outside of me. Well, we'll try again tomorrow night. A brief prayer. <laughs> Gracious God, help us to believe your word. Help us to trust Christ. Help us to encourage others to understand this great, amazing story of your redeeming love and of the eternal redemption that is ours in and through the work of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. And in his name we pray. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.